Hello. Sorry, I was having a little trouble getting connected, but let That's me. Fine. That's I... fine. Okay, let's see. I have enabled the screen sharing. So if you want to try that. What country are you in right now? I'm in Florida. Oh, okay. <laughs> There we go. Been good, and it would have been good if I changed my name on my thing because I've been using Pam's Zoom thing. So, but oh, whatever. I can, I can do that. Oh, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, I'm on the beach here in Florida. It actually looks like it's going to be a rainy day. The sun was shining earlier, but it's, I mean, they passed, the storms passed here, passed yeah. pretty quickly. We've been getting so much rain. Um, it looks like, so your screen mirroring, so it's showing me like the view I have includes me. And I'm wondering if once people come on, let me let whoever this is in so we can see if it happens with them too. Um, so I'm trying to tell if, can you see me on, like on the screen you're sharing? Do you see me twice or just once? Well, I was seeing you once. Now I've gone and lost that, so I don't know. Oh, wait, let's see. Now it, um, maybe it was on my end that now, because now it's gone. Right, and I'm not, and I'm not seeing my keynote. Yeah, right now what it says is you are sharing screen, but it doesn't show your actual um thing. Yeah, it did a minute ago. I know. So why did that happen? Um, let's see when you, oh goodness, no, kitty. um, <clears throat> is there anywhere, are you on an iPad? Yes. Yes. Okay. Do you have anywhere the, um, it's like your screen mirroring instead of, it's almost like, it's like we're seeing your whole screen instead of just, um, let me hit, like hit stop sharing for a second. And then, um, hi Maggie. Hi, Jessica. I, we, we let you in yep. early so we could, I was curious about something that was showing up on her screen. I wanted to see if it happened with you too. Um, okay, when you hit share screen again, does it give you the options of like sharing a specific window instead of um, just sharing everything? okay it's back now and but and you're I, still there <laughs> yeah I mean I can if I turn that off it's can you minimize the partic oh there I, you just, I just sort of flipped it off okay good okay so yeah um all right then yeah we should be good to go um and about how long is it? I think you said in your email and I don't remember. I think about an hour. Okay. Um, and I would wait till the end for questions. Okay. We can do that. All right. Um, I might go reheat my coffee. Do you, it, so everything seems to be working on your uh, end? Yeah, I think so. Okay. What makes me, what makes me so nervous is Hamilton's sister's class had niche me a couple of months ago. And I think because she had, uh, hymns or uh, music added to it it was too long or something she was coming from texas and doing it oh. in Ham hamilton anyway she no matter what steve did to help her he could not get on she could not use her um powerpoint and then oh. dan dan richard was on praise and worship about a month ago and <laughs> He ended up at the end saying, well, I had a, and he's not a techie kind of guy, but 
He yeah. said, I had this beautiful PowerPoint and none of you got to see it because he couldn't get on. And I think his too was because he had um, some music at the end. And it just makes the file way too big, I think. Yeah, okay. Well, I yeah. don't have that, but it just yeah. was starting to make me nervous. So I have yeah. everything written out in hard copy that I did by hand because I had no way to copy it to, uh, you know, with a printer. And so, yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, well, hopefully, <laughs> yeah. hopefully we won't have any issues. Um, okay. Well, I will be right back then. Hey everyone. So you're back. I'm back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll give it a couple more minutes. People are still joining. So Tuesday I flew from Costa Rica to Toronto and then Toronto or to Orlando all in one day. Wow. And tu Tuesday was my 87th birthday. Oh, so happy birthday. I didn't, miss, I didn't miss a bit of it sleeping because yeah. <laughs> there was nowhere to sleep. Yeah. Oh, that can be miserable traveling. Uh, along. Yeah, it was just interesting. I didn't realize in Costa Rica at the airport, and it's a beautiful airport in San Jose, but uh, I was like, as tall or taller than every single person there. Oh, wow. Like, I never thought of myself as being tall growing up. <laughs> growing up. 
But when you get to Central America and I guess South America, <laughs> we're just tall. Yeah. <laughs> when I went to Scandinavia, it was the opposite experience. Oh, true. Was... <laughs> and Vietnam people seem to be quite tall, although Chinese, not so much. But yeah, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Let's see, maybe we'll give it. Well, it's 934. We'll give it another couple minutes. I did. I asked on the email I sent out if the time change was um, the time from noon to 930, if that was keeping people away, because uh, it's hard to know because it, right. it dropped off when we came back from the summer. And so you don't know like what else changed, you know, over the summer, people may have just gotten out of the habit anyway. Um, and I only had one response from someone who has like a standing appointment at 10 o'clock on Saturdays. Um, no one else gave any feedback. Um, I know there were a couple of people who 930 worked better for so but I'll keep kind of trying to get feedback on that and see if people want to go back to having it later. It, it can right. be hard to find a day. Um, right. And a time. In the middle of the day. I mean, it didn't matter to me, so I didn't yeah. comment. And later this month, you've got Clady giving the uh, study weekend. Yeah, next weekend. It's coming oh, up. Weekend, okay. We've got a study weekend, actually, today. We've got a study today. Right, yeah. At one o'clock, starting at one. But we all heard that on Doug's thing from uh, uh, on James. We had it one of the nights oh. on, on Doug's class. Okay, yeah. Well, oh. and that might be part of why we only um, have a handful today. But it was it was um, small last time too. So, and we'll it's just... not the one o'clock, so it's not like it's this morning. So, yeah, yeah. Well, maybe I'll um, maybe I'll. Uh prompt like an hour or half hour before because I've noticed there isn't a prompt for this morning yeah it this just it I I try to sometimes do that but usually I send the email out you know the a week before or so um to remind people and then I just kind of don't get around to doing it but that that might yeah. help too <laughs> if you I bet if you gave a prompt right now Maybe a few people would join in probably in the next five minutes. I'll give that a try. I'll send out an yeah. email real quick. Can't hurt. How's your mom doing, Jessica? Oops. She's good. She is um, It's 8.30 in Arkansas. It's, that's a little early for her to be. I mean, she's probably awake, but that's a little early for her to right, be right. in a class. Um, but she, yeah, she's good. She's probably going to come here in April um, for a week or so. Mm -hmm. Let's see. She was on Doug's class. Was it yesterday or the day before? Anyway, she was on Doug's class this week. Your mother. Yeah. Yeah, last night I saw her. But I haven't been on uh, up until last night. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I've missed the last few days. I was on Monday and Tuesday this week, but life's getting busy. <laughs> It's amazing how many choices that we have we have now that we yeah. have to make between this class or that class because when I was um, a teenager it was a really big event to have any kind of thing happening <laughs> right yeah well I see you Nancy on Monday night on the learn to read the Bible effectively and have you been on uh Christendom Astray I I, I don't remember I'm on it on Tuesday yes yeah. yes I'm, I'm I'm on that as well and it's just, I mean, we all know what it says pretty much, but it to me, it's just nice to be with a group discussing the Bible and so on. Like, what yeah. else have we got to do? Mm -hmm. okay. And it's a totally different group. Yeah, I like that there are so many. Um, is the Christendom a stray one? I've seen the emails for that, but is it is it kind of just going through the book? Is that what you <laughs> And because it's over 300 pages, it, it's going to take a very long time. I'm sure Christ will be back before we're finished. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's slow. It's yeah. Very... Um, yeah, that's so that's nice to have different, not just a, a 
there's so many opportunities, but different formats too, like yeah, a book study. A variety, study, a variety, a variety of things. Yeah. For sure. yeah. Um, okay, well, let's go ahead and get started and we will see if that email prompts anyone to, <laughs> to hop in. Um, and you were going to record this, Jessica? It, yeah, it, it is recording. It actually automatically records and then I'll just, I'll clip off the front part where we were setting up before it okay. gets posted. Okay. Just, uh, I have a brother I'd sort of like to send it to and whatever, so yeah. Okay, and yeah. Some of my grandkids. <laughs> yeah, nice. Okay, and um, so obviously Sister Sandra is our teacher today and um, she's asked to hold comments till the end um, comments and questions. And um, Maggie, would you like to open with prayer for us? Sure. We, we come into your presence, Heavenly Father, mindful of the blessing we have to call you our Father and to be able to come to you in prayer. We thank you for this day which you have given us. We pray that you'll be with us this morning as we consider more, more aspects from your word. <clears throat> and be with our sister Sandra in her instructions and her her studies that she's she's planning to share with us. So we ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, go right ahead. All right. So I I have this topic, and I'm sure it's just not of interest to everybody, but it was something I was just very curious about. And I've had a few brothers point um, point out things, uh, one from George Booker's book, one from uh, Duncan Heaster's commentary on Matthew 3, and one from my brother Cliff Baines that used to live in uh, down in Nova Scotia. And I'm like, Wow, so there's other people that have been thinking of, about this too. And, and um, so I just decided I was going to put a lot of time into researching it. And I've just been as struck by the abundant evidence that the Pharisee Saul was not only at John's baptism of Jesus, but was there in the gospels throughout Christ's whole 30 and a half year ministry. And I'm wanting to share this with you. Saul was born in 5 AD. At the time of John's baptism of Jesus, he would be a very zealous 20-year-old in AD 25. Jesus is 30 at the time, and John the Baptist, we know, was six months older. Saul had been born and raised in Tarsus at, on the north in this map, Tarsus in Cilicia, but he was studying under Rabbi Gamaliel and that we're told this in Acts 22, 15, in Jerusalem, down at the bottom of the map, probably since the age of 13 or 14, when he had his bar mitzvah. We're told in Philippians 3, 5, that he was a Pharisee from the tribe of Benjamin. And later on, after his baptism in Damascus, which um, occurred about 35 AD, uh, 10 years from this time, so took 10 years before Saul was converted to Apostle Paul, and that's the time period that we are sort of going to cover in this talk. But after his baptism, he went down into Arabia, probably to Mount Sinai, for three years, we're told in Galatians 1. It was a lot of Pharisee had to beat got out of Saul before he could become an apostle. Now, in Acts 1, verse 21 and 22, we're given a criteria for what an apostle was. Now, most of our brethren usually say, it's just someone that was sent. Well, no. Um, to pick someone to replace Judas Iscariot, they had to, one, be accompanied all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. Two, beginning from the baptism of John. Three, to that day when he, Jesus, was taken up from us, the day of ascension. So if we look at this criteria and the fact that Paul is called an apostle, we have to then try to see if we can find him there at John 
Christ's baptism of Jesus and find him at the crucifixion. In Romans 11, 13, he says, I'm now speaking to you Gentiles, and as long as I am an apostle to you, and so on. He's calling himself an apostle. I am free. I am an apostle. This is 1 Corinthians 9, 1 and 2. I have seen the Lord Jesus and have led you to have faith in him. Others may think that I'm not an apostle, but you are proof that I am an apostle to you. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 8 to 11, last of all, Jesus was seen of me also as a one born out of due time. So it seems to be a different calling, different dispensation for Paul and also Barnabas, because he also is called an apostle. For I am the least of the apostles that that am not me to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. For seven years, he persecuted the saints from the time of the crucifixion until he was converted. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, the other apostles, so we preach and so you believed. <clears throat> In Matthew 19, 28, Jesus specifically says that there were really only to be 12 apostles. He says, when the son of man shall sit on the throne of his glory, you shall sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel speaking to the 12 apostles. And in Luke twenty two thirty, 30, he said, you will eat and drink in my kingdom and sit on the thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel during the kingdom age. So 12 apostles, people like Titus, Timothy, Silas, John, Mark, Apollos, James, Jesus's half brother, who wrote the book of James, they're never called apostles. But Paul and Barnabas are one, two, that are, were born out of due time. And I think there's a specific reason for this, and we'll go into that later. In Acts 14 and 14, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard the people of Lystra, Lystra called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercury, they were very upset. And it specifically calls both of them apostles in this particular spot. My guess is in the kingdom, they're going to rule over the Gentiles. Who's to say? I don't know. But um, if that's the case with the 12 apostles ruling over the 12 tribes of Israel, that's what we might assume. Now let's look into exactly who are the Pharisees and what they believed. Uh, they believed the entire Old Testament as law. They accepted the oral interpretation of the Old Testament as binding. Now, the oral trans interpretations came about during the captivity in Babylon, 587 AD, BC. Um, these oral traditions uh, started to, uh, I mean, they were people sitting around trying to think we don't have a priesthood we don't have a temple we aren't celebrating these sacrifices every day um, we aren't celebrating any of the feasts what should we be doing maybe we should wash our hands a little more maybe even up to our elbows maybe up to our armpits and so on and this is the kind of thing that came about um, they believe the study of torah was the highest act of worship the torah being the first five books of Moses, they believed in bodily resurrection and life after death. And this is what made them the bitter enemies of the Sadducees. Now, Paul, Nicodemus, and Joseph of Arimathea were all Pharisees. The scribes uh, in the Sanhedrin looked upon, they were looked upon as experts in the law of Moses. And at the age of 30, they were qualified to teach in the synagogues that were throughout the land. Sometimes they're called lawyers of the religious law. 
and most office, often they were in the leadership position. Matthew 23, 23, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, which is justice and mercy and faithfulness. faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the other. Now the Sadducees, who were the majority in the Sanhedrin, the group of 70 plus one high priest, 71, that ruled over Jerusalem, they believed only in the first five books of Moses, the, the Torah, as God's law. They rejected any oral traditions. Here we are into the oral traditions again that came about during the time of the exile. But they ran the temple and all the ceremonies. They dominated the Sanhedrin, as I said, but outside of the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees actually were in the majority in Jerusalem. They were the religious group ruling the council. And quite often in the book of Acts, we read council and we don't think in our head Sanhedrin, but the council is always this Sanhedrin, this ruling body. They, are closely, they were closely aligned with the Herodians and they did not believe in angels, and nor did they believe in the resurrection from the dead. And so Jesus said of them in Matthew twenty two twenty nine, 29, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God re regarding the resurrection. And Jesus spends quite a bit of time, I think, and we'll mention that a little later on, trying to convince them of resurrection. Um, and we know in uh, Acts that some of the priests and these Sadducees were baptized in uh, Acts 6, verse 7. A great number of the priests were obedient, believed, and obeyed. And also in Acts 4, 1 to 4. Now, in 2024, in Florida here in particular, I know because I worked for Jews down here when we first retired in the 90s, they have a lot of these oral traditions going on. For one thing, if you order a fridge in South Florida down in Fort Lauderdale area, like my daughter did uh, a number of years ago, it comes as a Sabbath keeping fridge. You might ask, what's a Sabbath keeping fridge? Well, it's one that you can set so that on the Sabbath, Friday night and all day Saturday, it won't turn the light on and it won't make ice. Or if it's Passover that's coming up at the end of March here, you can set it for that Sabbath because Passover is a Sabbath, as with uh, Rosh Hashanah in September and, and Day of Atonement in October. You set your fridge so it won't make ice and won't turn the light on. This is the kind of oral traditions that they come up with. Um, the very strict Hasidic Jews down in Plantation, Florida, and some of them in Miami and West Palm Beach and Boca Raton, they won't drive their car. So they live close enough that they can walk to the synagogue on Sabbath. But when they walk, you can wear a sweater, but you can't carry a sweater because that's work. You can't carry a diaper bag for your baby. You can push a stroller for some reason. Like these laws don't make sense, trust me. But like there's just so many of them. Friday evening, they turn the, all the lights on and then they either have timers to turn them off or they just leave them all on all through the Sabbath because you can't flick the switch to turn them on or off once sunset starts on Sabbath. This is considered work. And that's whenever you read about Pharisees in the Gospels, you need to think about these kind of laws that they were so intent on, these oral traditions. Like when Jesus' disciples on the Sabbath were picking heads of wheat and chewing them sort of like we would chew gum, but they said that was work because they were taking the husks off by rolling them in their hands and eating them. And I guess it's just the picking of it was work. So it's just very sort of ridiculous laws. Um, 
they also, of course, have the laws of uh, nowadays having two dishwashers because you wouldn't want anything that has been near dairy foods uh, used and put in the dishwasher close to anything that had been used for meat foods. So they have separate dishes, separate cutlery, se separate pots and pans. And for, for Passover in particular, some of them have separate kitchens in their basement so that no lent, uh, no leaven is ever near anything during Passover. So they have a separate kitchen, totally, that never has any leaven in it. Now I was in a home, we were house hunting and it happened to be during Passover time. They had duct tape on all the drawers uh, that might've had something in it that had leaven. So that was their way of keeping the leaven out and from coming out. It's like, like these are the oral traditions. All right. So we have a situation with John the Baptist being totally harassed and the same with Jesus after he started his ministry and had been baptized. But it was across the Jordan. This is over 20 miles from Jerusalem. It's an elevation of uh, 2,500 feet Jerusalem down to minus uh, 1,200 feet to the Dead Sea and the Jordan River. So that's over 3,500 feet elevation that they had to go down 20 miles a day's walk. A day's walk in Bible times was 20 to 25 miles. And they had to find a place to stay overnight, these Pharisees. They weren't normally used to do being over in the wilderness the other side of Jordan where John the Baptist hung out but they were sent and the Sanhedrin had decided amongst themselves that they had a duty to check out anybody that came to town and of course we know from Daniel's prophecies that they had been expecting Messiah at this time because Simeon in the temple and Anna had both said they were waiting and at the time of Jesus's birth 30 years before. So, and all of a sudden, at this time, John the Baptist, ready to baptize Jesus, they're getting quite eager. Where's Messiah? Who's Messiah? So the religious authorities in Jerusalem sent, it says in John 1, in 19 to 24, priests and temple helpers to ask John who he was. He told them plainly, oh, I'm not the Messiah. And finally they said, well, then who are you then? We have to give an answer to the ones who sent us. Tell us who you are. Some Pharisees have also been sent to John. Sent. And I think Saul was one of these Pharisees at 20 years old that had been sent to check out John. They asked him, why are you baptizing people if you're not the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet? And in Luke 3, 15, at the baptism of Jesus, everyone became excited and wondered, could John be the Messiah? They're looking to see, to check out, to harass, to interrogate John the Baptist. And later on up in Galilee, Jesus, when he was preaching, constantly being harassed because they were sent. Many Pharisees and Sadducees in Matthew 3, 7 at the baptism of Jesus also came to be baptized. Well, I don't really think they did. They came to check John out. But John said to them, you bunch of snakes, who warned you to run from the coming judgment? And after the strictest sect of our religion, Saul said, or Paul later says that when he was Saul, he lived a Pharisee in Acts 26, 5. But John had a great influence on Saul. In uh, Matthew 3 and Luke 3, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming, coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And we're going to look into this from the notes on these chapters from Duncan Heaster's Bible Companion. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, which they didn't. And in Romans 6, we know that John's baptism had a big influence on 
Saul because he wrote the chapter that used at every single baptism I've ever witnessed in my 66 years since my own baptism. Saul wrote the chapter on baptism. He knew about baptism. Where else would he learn about it if he hadn't been there? So in Duncan's notes, getting things straight in our lives is a question of immediate response. He warns people to see, flee from the wrath to come. This was what their changed lives and baptisms were to be about, a fleeing from the wrath to come. And like I say, it took take Saul seven years to finally get this and get to his baptism. John speaks as if that wrath to come is imminent. It's staring them in the face like a wall of forest fire and they are to flee away from it. And yet Paul, in one of his many allusions to John's message, which perhaps he had heard himself live, speaks of the wrath to come as being the wrath of the final judgment in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, or possibly that of AD 70 in 1 Thessalonians 2.16. But both those events would have not have come upon the majority of John's audience. This would have been uh, 45 years after this baptism time. Uh, 70 AD so they would none of them would have been alive John then I think is speaking of something different and the day of wrath to come is clearly ultimately to be at the Lord's return at our judgment Revelation 6 17 and Revelation eleven eighteen. yet John zooms his hearers forward in time to perceive that they face condemnation and judgment day right now as they hear the call of the gospel this was a feature of John. He had the faith which sees things which were not as though they already are. When he looked at Jesus walking towards him, he commented that here was the Lamb of God. Okay. A phrase the Jews would have totally understood as referring to the Lamb which was about to be sacrificed on Passover at the end of John 1, the first Passover in Jesus' ministry time, John 1.29. John presumably was referencing the description of the crucified Jesus in Isaiah 53, 7, which the most Jews will not even read because they don't see him as a suffering servant. That's why they'd never believed in um, Jesus being Messiah. But John, he foresaw it all. It was as if he saw Jesus was already being led out to die, even though that event was over three years distant. And so he could appeal to his audience to face Judgment Day as if they were standing there already. And we need to have that same perspective because we don't even know if we'll still be alive at the end of the day. John the Baptist's ministry was so that the crooked nation of Israel should be made straight and ready to accept Jesus as Messiah. In Luke 3, 5, God's enabling, enabling power was present so that this might have happened. But the same word is used in Acts 2.40 in Peter's uh, day of Pentecost speech and in Philippians 2.15 written by Paul to describe Israel as still being a crooked nation. John's preaching like ours was potentially able to bring about the conversion of an entire nation. So instead of being discouraged by the lack of response to our witness, let's remember the enormous potential power which there is behind it. Every word, witness of any kind, a track left lying on a seat or one in a laundromat that I know someone found and in fact, two people found and happened to um, end up in the truth, brothers in Christ, has such huge potential conversion power lodged within it, a power from God himself. John's mission was to prepare Israel for Christ so to figuratively bring low the hills and mountains, the proud Jews at first century Israel, and raise the valleys, that is, inspire the humble with the real possibility of salvation in Christ. Paul uses this same Greek word for bring low no few, fewer than three times concerning how the gospel has humbled him. Acts 20, 19, 2 Corinthians eleven seven, 7, and Philippians 4, 12. It's as if Paul is saying, John's preaching did finally have its effects upon me. It fu did finally make me humble enough for the Lord Jesus. And as John made straight paths for men's feet that might come unto Christ in Matthew 3, 3, so did Paul. 
in Hebrews 12, 13. There was another reason behind John's appeal for repentance. It was that he perceived how eager God is to forgive and how our acceptance, acceptance of that forgiveness is his glory and his salvation. John says, quoting Isaiah 40, but four to five, that if men repent and ready themselves for the Lord's coming, then all flesh will see the salvation of God in Luke 3, 6. But he is changing the quotation. Isaiah said that all flesh shall see the glory of God. But saving men and women is the thing that God glories in. And just a bit more here. Uh, Paul especially wants his hearers to <clears throat> imitate him. And this is uh, what they have seen in him as he preached they were to do. So I suggest the emphasis should be on who told you to flee from the wrath of God. The sense is not you lot of sinners. Huh? And where did you lot hear the need for repentance? Rather, is it a rhetorical question? Who warned these Pharisees and Sadducees to flee from the wrath to come? Well, it was John himself. Here we see another window onto the humility of John in appeal. He is saying that he too has confessed and repented of his sins. And he knew this was witnessed in his life. And he asked the legalistic Pharisees to follow his example. John was asking them to repent of their legalism and accept Jesus as Messiah. And it would seem that John had had to pass through that very same path himself, fleeing from the Essenes legalism, which it seems that he had got association with. And Elijah, John's role model, was another man who led, was led to repent of exclusivism and legalism. He said three different times in 1 Kings 18, 22, I, even I, only are, are left. Well, no, in 1 Kings um, 19, verse 18, uh, the Lord says 7,000 prophets have also not bowed their knee to Baal. So we have to be humble. We have to repent. We have to come to uh, obey in every point. The point is clinched by a look at the Greek word translated warn. It literally means to exhibit or exemplify. John was the pattern for them. And if Paul was indeed amongst that crowd of cynical Pharisees, Paul was ultimately John's most stellar convert, although little did he realize it at the time. The same can happen with our preaching. We may make converts years after our death, and the lesson comes home clearly that the preacher or the teacher is to be the living embodiment of his or her message. Walk your talk. The word being preached made flesh by the preacher. To flee from the anger to come is a very common idea of Paul's, especially in his letter to the Romans. Romans 1.18, Romans 2.5, Romans 2.8, Romans 3.5, Romans 4.15, Romans 5.9, Romans 9.22, Romans 12.19, and Romans 13.4-5, and in 1 Thessalonians 2.16. This surely alludes to in, uh, here in speaking... <laughs> wrath has come upon the orthodox Jews. <laughs> Jesus seems to say that it is now possible for that group to flee the coming wrath. Even in this life, the frame of opportunity can come to an end before even our death. We just don't have the time to repent and be baptized. So it's imperative to speak to others about the urgency of this, especially now as we see the Lord's uh, appearance so close. Paul alluded to some parts of the Gospels much more than others. An example of this is the way in which he alluded to, extensively to the passages related to John the Baptist. I would re uh, suggest that the reason for this is that he saw John as somehow his hero, one of whom he had a deep respect. In doing so, he was sharing the estimation of his Lord, who also saw John as one of his greatest believers. There are many unconscious links between Paul's writings and the records of John, indicating how deeply the example and words of John were in Paul's mind. And there's a few here from Matthew 3, 7 that Paul quotes in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, 1 Thessalonians 5.9, and in John 3, 3, 
he quotes it in 1 Corinthians 15, 47. Or consider how John said that wicked Jewry would be hewn down in Matthew 3, 10. And of course, Paul uses this to describe the Jewish branches, how they'd be cut off in Romans eleven twenty two, 22 and Romans eleven twenty four. Paul saw himself as being like the best man who had betrothed the believers to Christ in 2 Corinthians 11, 2 to 3, just as John had described himself as the friend of the bridegroom in John 3, 28. Or again, reflect how Paul's mention of John just happens that he mentions John, the, the Baptist in Acts 13, 24 to 25, and it adds nothing to his argument. It seems out of context, but it surely indicates the degree to which John was never far below the surface in Paul's thinking. So I, it, I know this has been lengthy, but I just thought it was so important to see these connections because we never think of that. We never go there. And of course, where do we have, uh, like I said before, the longest chapter and the chapter used most often at baptisms? It's Paul's writings. So then we have to consider, was Saul a member of the Sanhedrin? And I think we can prove that quite easily from his own writings. Saul informed on or to the Sanhedrin and consented to the execution of Stephen. In Acts 6, verse 10 to 15, and they were not able to withstand the wisdom and the spirit by which Stephen spoke. Then they suborned men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and seized him and brought him into the council, the Sanhedrin. Like I said, when you see council, that's the Sanhedrin. And they set up false witnesses to testify against Stephen, who said, this man ceases not to speak against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered unto us. And all that sat in that council, the Sanhedrin, fastening their eyes on Stephen, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel, really. And they ended up stoning him. In Acts 7, verse 57 to 59, but they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed upon him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul, Saul the Pharisee that we're trying to understand today. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon the Lord and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Saul was possibly personally debating with Stephen in Cilicia, the Cilicia synagogue in Jerusalem. Paul, having come from Cilicia, as I said before, up in Tarsus, he was familiar with um, people from there. In Acts 6, verse 9 to 10, it says, but one day some men from the synagogue of freed slaves, as it was called, started to debate with Stephen. They were Jews from Cyrene, Alexandria, Cilicia, and the province of Asia. None of them could stand against the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen spoke. But they still crucified or stoned him to death. Saul became the Sanhedrin's prosecuting attorney lawyer. And we have a lot of lawyer speak in a lot in a lot of Paul's writings. It's quite interesting to really look into that. Uh, just in our readings last week, I was noticing in uh, 1 Corinthians 1, he starts talking about um, these people with uh, the Corinthians, whether they were baptized by Apollos, whether they were baptized by Cephas, whether they were baptized by himself. He didn't know. And then in chapter three, he starts all over again with the same kind of argument. It's so typical of lawyers. In uh, Acts 26, verse nine to 11, of course, I myself, so this is Paul, was convinced that it was necessary to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus the Nazarene. And that is what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons by the authority I received from the chief priests from the Sanhedrin, of course, but I also cast my vote against them when they were sentenced to death. That vote had to happen in the Sanhedrin council. I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to force them to blaspheme because I was so furiously enraged at them. I went to persecute them even in foreign cities. 
And in Acts 9, verse 1 and 2, uh, just before he's uh, uh, not uh, uh, struck blind and three days blind, Saul says, but Saul, yet breathing threatening and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and asked him letters to go to Damascus under the synagogues, that if he found any that were of the way, the name that the believers had adopted so that they could identify themselves, whether men or women, he might bring them bound back to Jerusalem from Damascus. And in Galatians 1.13, for you have heard of my former way of life in Judaism, how I was savagely persecuting the church of God and trying to destroy it. One thing we know about Pharisees is they got to know Jesus very well because they're in almost every story in the Gospels. They are in so many stories, especially when they're, Jesus is talking in parables, because he says in Matthew 13, he's only going to talk to the crowds and Pharisees in parables. Afterwards, when he spoke in parables, he explained it quite clearly to the disciples. But to the crowds and the Pharisees, he spoke in parables. Because from Isaiah, it says that they had ears that they couldn't hear, eyes and they couldn't see, and their hearts were far from God. But Paul seems to learn about mercy, and we're going to see how that might have happened that changed him. In 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 14, in the Living Bible, and I've started using the Living Bible because I was given a new journaling Bible that's New Living Translation a couple of months ago. I'm really enjoying it. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him. Even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ, in my insolence, I persecuted his people. But God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with the faith and love that come from Christ Jesus. We all know the parable of the Good Samaritan. And Luke 10, verse 25, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and made trial of Jesus, trying to test Jesus, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? I'm wondering, and since I started doing this paper, was this the lawyer Saul? And this might have been the lesson that helped to change him to find mercy because the answer in the end is the one that showed mercy. So we're talking about Saul being this lawyer. Uh, it's sort of funny to me in Romans 7 that he even talks to himself as if he's putting himself on trial. Whoa, the things that I want to do, I don't do them. I wish I could do the things that I know I should do, but they're not the things I do. Paraphrasing, of course. But he goes on and on and on and on the same argument. Lawyers speak. And uh, it's the same in Romans 9 with the potter in the clay. Can't the potter do what he wants with the, his piece of clay? I mean, it's the potter's right, isn't it, to do what he wants with a piece of clay? Can't he break it and start over again? And so on, lawyer speak. And also in Romans 11 with the Jew and Gentiles. Well, you, you Jews were cut off, locked off, hewn down off that olive tree so that the Gentiles could be grafted in. But those Gentiles could be hewn down and you Jews could be put back in it's <laughs> the argument that a lawyer might use and so we know this parable and he asks what shall I do to inherit eternal life well you know what Saul you don't do anything to inherit something it's not about works and this had to be a Pharisee since the Sadducees didn't even believe in resurrection and eternal life. They thought your life continued through your family. And that's why all the Sadducees were married so that they could have children and their pro uh, progeny would carry on. But to inherit something, you do nothing. 
you just have to be an heir. And who is it that writes about us, how we become, writes to us about how we become an heir? In Galatians 3, 26 to 29, Paul says, as many of you as have been baptized, because he knew all about baptism, baptized into Christ, you then are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promises. And Paul writes extensively about salvation not based on a merit system. So to an, what must I do? Well, you do nothing because it's by grace in Ephesians 2, 8 that you're saved. Paul learned this lesson. He thought as a Pharisee that you had to keep doing these works, these oral traditions, make sure you didn't keep them. Don't step over the red line and so on. But it's not about that. By grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. And in Romans 3, 24, being justified freely by his grace. In Titus 3, 7, being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And Saul also asks in this parable, if he's the lawyer, who is my neighbor? Well, it just happens that the Pharisees separated themselves from any potential source of defilement. Their group of fellow Pharisees were their neighbors, the ones who had the same zeal for the law. They would consider it very unclean to go near a beaten, half to death person lying on the side of the road. And that would certainly defile them. And then Jesus asks, which of these three, the priest, the Levite, the despised Samaritan, was the neighbor? Saul, as a Pharisee studying under Gamaliel, would, would have understood exactly who this priest was, exactly who the Levites were, and exactly who the despised Samaritan would have been. And Saul's answer is, the one who showed mercy. He that showed mercy on him. And Jesus says, go and do thou likewise. And Paul writes in Romans 11, 30 to 32. Once you Gentiles were rebels against God, but when the people of Israel rebelled against him, God was merciful to you instead. Now they are the rebels. And God's mercy has come to you so that you too will share in God's mercy. For God has imprisoned everyone in disobedience so he could have mercy on everyone paul learned about mercy and possibly from this parable now i mentioned before that uh, the sanhedrin the sadducees not believing in the resurrection have uh, jesus gave them in the three and a half years i think plenty of time to really think about whether a resurrection was a fact or not. And I don't know how in the first five books of Moses, you could not believe in angels because it was an angel that spoke to Moses. It was an angel that uh, whose finger had written the Ten Commandments and uh, the angel appeared in the burning bush and the angel followed them for 40 years uh, as the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. Like, Sadducees didn't believe in angels and they didn't believe in eternal life and resurrection, but um, Abraham knew that he would um, inherit the land forever and you have to be resurrected to do that. So it's just a very hard concept how they could convince themselves that these were not true facts. But one of the, the after um, the turning of water to wine, one of the first uh, miracles was the raising of the widow of Nain's son. And the widow didn't ask for her son to be raised. They were just walking through the streets with the coffin ready to be buried because Jews bury their dead the same day they die. And this woman would be totally grief stricken. And I think Jesus might have been thinking of her, his own mother three years hence when she would be definitely the widow and definitely the one that had a dead son. But uh, he raises with without any comment about your faith has saved you or um, go now to the priest or anything else like Jesus normally said, he just decided to raise that widow's son. So these crowds of Pharisees and Sadducees would have seen this. 
and the Sadducees were there seeing Lazarus raised in John 11. Um, and I think the, it's the Sadducees who are really, really concerned in Matthew 62, 66 to put a guard at the tomb of Jesus because they knew that Jesus had said a number of times that in three days and three nights he would rise from the dead. Right? And it'd be like Jonah in the whale's belly, or the fish's belly. And so they were the ones that wanted to set this guard. They asked Pilate to set a guard. And I sort of laughed because Jesus didn't need that uh, stone to be removed from that tomb because later on in the day when he was resurrected, he went into a house without the door being open. So he could have come out of that grave without the stone being rolled away. But I think God had the angels roll it away. So those guards didn't have to stay there until now, 2000 years later, they'd still be watching that tomb because the Jews, the strict Jews do not believe in Jesus yet, nor the fact that he was raised from the dead. And, uh, there's many places, Peter and uh, John, when they're actually in uh, Acts 5, uh, after they were in prison, they were brought before the council, the Sanhedrin, and they're teaching about resurrection. So the Sadducees have been given many opportunities to learn about eternal life and resurrection. And where do we find the chapter about resurrection and immortal life. It's 1 Corinthians 15, written by Paul. And it's a very long chapter, and it goes into it quite clearly about what resurrection is. And if Jesus had not risen from the dead and been given eternal life, he certainly couldn't have appeared to Saul and converted him the, the way he was. And um, Paul speaks of being taught by Jesus for the three years in Arabia. And it was the truth as it is in Jesus, as it says in Ephesians 4, 21, so that he could would throw off his former way of life, which was corrupted by lust and deception. So in this passage, we now have a selection that uh, George Booker pointed out to me in one of his latest books, that this God forbid is spoken by Paul and Paul only, other than this particular place in Luke 20 uh, in the, the Gospels. Other than that, it's in Paul's writings. So, and at the beginning of this, it looks like there's a deputation sent from the Sanhedrin. It starts off with the chief priests and the scribes came unto Jesus with the elders and spoke unto Jesus. Tell us, by what authority do, doest thou these things? This is in Luke 21 to 19. And who is he that gave thee this authority? They're trying to pin him down. They're trying to get him to say that it was God. Like uh, at his crucifixion, they asked him the same question. And they would have convicted him right here immediately. And this is only uh, two weeks, no, a week before Passover, when this chapter is being spoken of a week before the crucifixion of Jesus. And they're saying, by what authority? So Jesus goes back to John the Baptist. It was the authority of John that pointed him out to everybody and gave him the authority when the uh, spirit came down in, on his head in the form of a dove and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That's the authority. And if Saul had been there, he would have seen this for sure. And I think he was. And so in this parable, I just want to read, we all know this parable. And uh, I'm just going to make a few comments about it. But when we talk about the Lord's vineyard, I always like to go to Isaiah 5. And I'm just going to read the first seven verses. And I'm reading it from the New Living Translation. It's a song about the Lord's vineyard. Now I will sing for the one I love, a song about his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a rich and fertile hill. He plowed the land, he cleared its stones and planted it with the best vines. In the middle, he built a watchtower and he carved a wine press in the nearby rocks. And then he waited for a harvest of sweet grapes, but the grapes that grew were bitter. Now you people of Jerusalem and Judah, 
you judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard that I have not already done? When I expected sweet grapes, why did my vineyard give me bitter grapes? Now, let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will tear down its hedges and let it be destroyed. I will break down its walls and let the animals trample it. I will make it a wild place where the vines are not pruned and the ground is not hoed, a place overgrown with briars and thorns. I will command the clouds to drop no rain in it, on it. The nation of Israel is the vineyard of the Lord of heaven's armies. The people of Judah are his pleasant garden. He expected a crop of justice, but instead of he found oppression. He expected to find righteousness, but instead he heard cries of violence. And that's what we're hearing from these Pharisees and Sadducees, cries of violence. So at the end of this parable, it says, wherefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do unto these terrible, terrible vine dressers, uh, farmers, um, servants, these, the Jews. He shall come and destroy these husbandmen and give the vineyard to others, to the Gentiles. And when they heard it, they said, oh, God forbid. And he beheld them, this is Jesus, and said, what is this then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. And the chief priests and the scribes, the same hour, a week before his actual crucifixion, sought at this time to lay hands on him. And they feared the people, for they perceived that he had spoken this parable against them. Now, just a week previous to this was the raising of Lazarus. And in Luke 19, the very last verse, it says that um, they at that time were actually wanting to re-kill Lazarus and to kill Jesus. And Jesus had to go into hiding. It's uh, an interesting thing because we never hear of this little town that he went to. It's a town called Ephraim, 18 miles northeast of Jerusalem, a day's journey. And there's a fort there that apparently hid in, he hid there for a week before this particular event from the time of Lazarus raising. Um, it's just an interesting verse in John 11 the, at the very end. And um, he goes into hiding because he knows the time for his crucifixion is at Passover because he's the Passover lamb. So he had to try to prevent his being killed ahead of time. Like such a, a dangerous, dangerous situation at the time. Uh, the Sanhedrin and uh, these Pharisees were saying, the Romans are going to come and take away our place and our nation. In John 11, verse uh, 53, they're afraid of this. And it's interesting that Hitler during the Holocaust uh, copied the same kind of thing. This Sanhedrin group, that was ruling over Jerusalem and the Jews was totally under the thumb of the Romans. They did nothing but what Rome said they could do. They were allowed to preach their uh, religion freely and that was sort of the end of it. Other than that, all rule was under Rome. Now Hitler, he set up Jewish councils in the ghettos and in the camps, the extermination camps, that were totally doing Hitler's bidding. They were Jewish men on these councils and they were do, having evil plans against their own Jewish brother. And this is exactly what the Sanhedrin is about. Uh, like I just find it unbelievable. So let's see where we see God forbid. And I'm asking who do you suppose the Pharisee was who said, God forbid, in Luke 20, verse 16. Whatever your translation is, is, and Wycliffe and Tyndale all use this as what it should, as what this should say, it should be God forbid, but all the, a lot of the newer translations change it. But whatever it is, it's used over and over again, only by Paul. 
in Romans 3, 4, 6, and 31, Romans 6, 2, and 15, Romans 7, 7, and 13, Romans 9, 14, Romans 11, 1, and 11, 1 Corinthians 6, 15, and Galatians 2, 17, Galatians 3, 21, and Galatians 6, 14. God forbid, Paul keeps saying over and over and over. He heard it when Jesus gave this parable, parable about the husbandman and the evil, the evil husbandman in God's vineyard. 14 times. And the other question I would ask is, does Jesus use the word blind in Matthew 23 specifically to point to the Pharisee Saul, who in Acts 9, verse 1 to 19, is blinded, the only person that's blinded for three days so that they can be converted as the sort of the final, we're going to get you, Paul. This is the time you, you've done enough harm, seven years of persecuting Christians and persecuting the saints and uh, it's time for you to be converted Matthew 23 6 you blind guides Matthew 23 7 you fools and blind Matthew 23 19 you fools and blind again Matthew 23 24 you blind guides and Matthew 23 26 thou blind Pharisee and I think we could add Saul's name specifically after this And in John 9, verse 20, 40 and 41, after Jesus gave sight to the man that was 38 years blind from birth, and this was six months at the Feast of Tabernacles before the crucifixion, some of the Pharisees asked, are we blind also? Whoa, well, yeah, you're quite blind, Pharisees. And Jesus replies, but if you were blind, you wouldn't have any sin. And it's pointing back to Isaiah 6, 9, and 10, as I said before, that he mentions when he starts talking in parables in Matthew 13, verse 14 to 16. He says that he's only going to speak to the crowds, including these Pharisees, in, that were sent from the Sanhedrin in parables. Because there's blind, they can't see, they have ears, they can't hear. You Jews, Paul says in Romans 2, 19, he's following up almost sounding like Jesus. You Jews are convinced that you are a guide for the blind. As he had been, blind leaders of the blind. And in Revelation 3.17, we know that Jesus denounces the Laodiceans because thou sayest, and to me, you could point this to the Pharisees as well as to ourselves, of course. You say, I am rich and increased in goods and I have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched miserable, poor, blind, and naked. The Pharisees definitely fit in this category. And was Saul, the Pharisee, there during the night preparing to convict and crucify Jesus Christ, both in the Sanhedrin and before Pilate? He makes a stunning comment Paul does in 1 Timothy 6, 13. Christ Jesus, who made his good confession before Pontius Pilate. I cannot imagine Paul, a lawyer, saying this if he received it as hearsay. He made a good confession before Pontius Pilate. In John 18, 33 to 38, Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? So you are a king? Jesus says, you say I am a king. I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. Pilate says, he's not guilty of any crime. Because he had made a good confession before Pilate. And Paul seems to be quoting this. In Acts 22, verse 30, and in 23, verse 1, Paul addresses those Jewish people, men in the Sanhedrin when he's on trial at the end of Acts. Brethren. And it sounds like he's buddy-buddy with these men in the Sanhedrin during his trial. He speaks brethren. 
He's knowing them all along. He's been their buddies all through this harassment of Jesus. Peter, when he addresses the Sanhedrin in Acts 4 and 8, he says, rulers and elders of the people. They weren't brethren to Peter, but they were brethren, buddies, friends, this group of Sanhedrin. So I find that interesting. How does Apostle Paul describe his life before the, his conversion in 35 AD? 10 years after he was at John's baptism and seven years after the crucifixion of Jesus as Saul the Pharisee. He says great persecution against the Ecclesia in Jerusalem. This happened between 28 AD and 35 AD. So that the believers were all scattered abroad except the apostles. And that statement alone to me is extremely interesting because the apostles with the full power without measure of the Holy Spirit did not obey the command of Christ in Matthew 28, Luke 24, Mark 16 and Acts 1, go into all the world, go into Judea, Samaria, and all parts of the world to preach the gospel. They were hunkered down in Jerusalem for these whole seven years. It was the believers that were scattered because they were afraid for their life. They didn't have the power of the Holy Spirit, and they had to be scattered. And it's the believers that needed the encouragement and comfort in all these countries of Asia Minor and Greece and so on and Rome that uh, Paul was sent to preach to finally. But he didn't go preaching for another 10 years from now. So it's like 17 years from the crucifixion of Christ before Paul actually went on the first missionary journey. And it seems like he is, and Barnabas, are called and called apostles so that they might finally get this message out to the believers throughout the whole world. Because the apostles hadn't obeyed. That's all there is to it for seven years now. It's Philip the Evangelist in Acts 8 that uh, went into Samaria and uh, ba baptized the um, sorcerer. Anyway, that's just, uh, I've heard talks actually by Brother Alan Eyre on the fact that the um, apostles just did not obey this command. Um, he made havoc of the ecclesia. Acts 8.3, he entered into every house, hauling out men and women, committing them to prison, Acts 8.3. He persecuted them to death. He murdered people in Acts 22, 4, he says. He entered into synagogues, beating and imprisoning believers in Acts 22, 19. He was imbued with authority from that Sanhedrin council, he says in Acts 26, 10. Which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. Being sent, as I said, he was sent to John's baptism to check and harass John. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. I've already quoted this verse. But it's just important to see how intense he was, how zealous he was for doing what he thought was right. And I'm going to make a comment about how I see that. Um, anyways, went over and above the call of duty beyond measure, it says in Galatians 1.13. And meanwhile, Saul, still breathing out threats to murder the Lord's disciples, went to the high priest and requested these letters to go to Damascus. And that's why he was there. Um, struck blind for three days and then converted. I was circumcised on the eighth day from the people of Israel and the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. I lived according to the law of Pharisee, and in my zeal for God, I persecuted the church according to the righteous stipu sti righteousness stipulated in the law. I was blameless, he says. 
And this reminds me of Eichmann's defense in Jerusalem in 1961 when he was put on trial for his part in the final solution because he really, uh, the buck stopped at him. He was responsible for killing six million Jews, Eichmann, Adolf Eichmann. And his defense was no remorse, no repentance. I don't know why memorials aren't erected around the whole world in my honor. I only did as I was commanded, obeying all our German laws. And I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing this, but this is what he said on trial. And it sort of sounds like Paul's trying to make the same kind of claim um, in my zeal. And according to the righteousness so stipulated in the law, I was blameless, really. <clears throat> Showing no mercy, but he learned about mercy as I've tried to point out. I am grateful for, to the one who has strengthened me, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he considered me faithful in putting me into ministry. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and an arrogant man, for, but I was treated with mercy. And in Acts 9, 31, we have a, like sometimes these small little statements jump off the page to me, but they're so important and we just don't spend enough time, I don't think, on them. But it says in Acts 9, 31, then had the churches rest. And this was in about 38 AD when finally they realized that they were at rest. Paul had been gone, gone off to Arabia for three years and there was no more persecuting the saints. Oh, what a relief. And at 38 AD would have been a 10 years after the cruci uh, crucifixion of Jesus. And they're saying throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, they were edified, finally at rest with no persecution. A persecuting Pharisee such as Saul that had spent all that time. So in Damascus, he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Paul says, who are you, Lord? I think he knew uh, Jesus's voice. I think he quite well knew Jesus's voice. And he knew it was the Lord, but he was a surprised, astonished, taken aback. Why are you persecuting me? And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do in Acts 9, 4 to 6. Now there's a principle with Jesus that runs through the gospels. Anyone who receives you receives me. And anyone who receives me receives the Father who sent me. And it's Matthew 10, verse 40. And Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In Matthew 5, 44. And I'm wondering if all, all these years, Jesus, even as an immortal, is praying for his enemy, Saul that was persecuting for seven years the believers. But Paul himself says in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty four of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. So that's 195 lashes. And it was by my own brethren, the Jews, the Jewish believers that became the Judaizers that went about harassing Paul exactly as he had harassed John the Baptist and Jesus himself. But Paul says in Romans 9 and Romans 10, 9, 2, verse 2 and 3 and Romans 10, 1, that he actually is praying and is wanting to or would be willing to give his life for his brethren, these Judaizers. Um, if that could, was possible. He says that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, Jewish believers that had become the, wanted to keep the law of Moses as long, uh, along with the grace and mercy of Christ. And it, you just can't do it that way. And brethren, in Romans 10, 1, my heart's desire and prayer. He's praying 
to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So it would take another three years to get the Pharisee out of Saul, but it is possible for us to change. The Lord said, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer. And he certainly did. In 2 Corinthians 11, we have a list of his sufferings, and they are just unbelievable. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight. Three days later, this is and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. And then he got up and was baptized. He didn't say, what shall I do now, as the believers in Acts 2 said to Peter, well, what then shall we do? No, Paul knows exactly what to do. He'd been there at John's baptism. He knew he had to repent. He knew what was required. And we're not even told, you know, like the Ethiopian eunuch says in uh, Acts uh, 9. Well, here's water. What prevented me from being baptized? No. If you think back to um, when Naaman the leper was told to go and wash in the Jordan, he says, well, no, 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 no. And I, in 2 Kings 5. I want to, I'm from Damascus in Syria. There's great water there. Two rivers, Arbana and Farpar. It's called Bar Barada now. But these two rivers that he said were so clean and lovely. So there's two rivers that Paul could have, Saul could have been baptized in. We don't know which. We're not told a thing. That's it. That's all. He got up and was baptized because he knew exactly what to do. And he wrote the chapter on baptism that we use. But it would take another three years to get the Pharisee out of Saul with direct one-on-one -on -one teaching from the Lord Jesus. In the middle of Acts 9, 19, it seems that Galatians 1, 15 to 18 fits in right in the middle of a verse. And it says, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, Immediately, I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, the 12 apostles that are stuck in Jerusalem. But I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus after three years. So and then he went 10 years up to Tarsus to preach there before he started his missionary journey. Uh, but after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter in a bow within 15 days. So, and some of the teachings that Paul might have heard, if you really look at his writings, when he was those so three years in uh, Arabia, and things like this, I like to think about because I have the time to do that. But anyway, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three in our memorial service, he wasn't, Saul wasn't at the Last Supper, trust me. They we're told only 12 apostles were there. But he says, for I have received of the Lord that which I also deliver to you. So he received this when he was the three years being taught by Jesus. In Acts 20, verse 35, he says that we're to remember the words of the Lord Jesus. But it just happens we never have these words written in the Gospels. And he says, it's how he said, but we have no record of it. That he, Jesus apparently said, and probably to Saul when he was in Arabia, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And in 1 Corinthians 1, 17, Paul says, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And we actually don't have a record of that in Paul's writings of when he started to preach. He does say he baptized Stephanus in 1 Corinthians 1 that we studied last week. But uh, he really was not sent to baptize. And Jesus must have told him that during these three years. So going back to the criteria for apostles and summing up, they had to have all 
accompanied all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to the day when Jesus was taken up from them in the ascension. So that's from Acts 1, 21 and 22. And Paul is called an apostle. Romans eleven thirteen. I'm speaking to you Gentiles as long as I am an apostle to you. And I am free. I am an apostle. I have seen the Lord Jesus and have led you to have faith in him. Others may think that I am not an apostle, but you are proof that I am an apostle to you. In 1 Corinthians 9, 1 and 2. Now, another wor word came up, especially during these Hamas riots in every city around the world, pro-Palestinian. And I, I was led to this by an exhortation by a brother in Arlington. And he said, uh, the word fan, the origin, origin of it, is an Americanism dating back to 1885 to 1890. It's short for fanatic. And boy, I have to say that Saul was a fanatic. Seven years of persecuting the saints. And we have the term uh, team. If you're a fan or a fanatic, uh, you usually represent a team. Well, we could talk about team Pharisee or the team Judaizers that ended up harassing Paul himself. And now on the news, we hear team Hamas. But these people... They really don't know what they're talking about. They've interviewed some of them. They have no idea what river, from the river to the sea, what it even means. So Merriam-Webster says they have an intense, uncritical devotion to a matter. And this is exactly how I see Pharisee Saul. An uncritical devotion to a matter. Zealous beyond and Paul writes about this kind of behavior in Acts 19, 28 to 41. At this, their anger boiled in Ephesus, and they began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And soon the whole city was filled with confusion. Toronto, uh, Mississauga, Vancouver, London, England, Sydney, Australia, you name it, Paris, anywhere in the world right now. Everyone rushed to the amphitheater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, who were Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. Some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, also sent a message to him, begging him not to risk his life by entering the amphitheater. Inside, the people were all shouting, some one thing, some another. Everything was in confusion. In fact, most of them didn't even know why they were there. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander forward and told him to explain the situation. He motioned for silence and he tried to speak. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison, great is Artemis of the Ephesians for about two hours. After the city secretary quieted the crowd, two hours later, he said, men of Ephesus, what person is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is the keeper of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image that fell from heaven? So because these facts are indisputable, you must quiet, keep quiet, and not do anything reckless. For you have brought these men here who are neither temple robbers nor blasphemers of our goddess. These are the Jews. If then Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with them, him, have a complaint against someone, the courts are open and there are pro -counsels. Let them bring charges against one, one another there. But if you want anything in addition, it will have to be settled in a legal assembly. For we are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause we can give to explain this disorderly gathering. And after he had said this, this was Alexander, the Jew, he dismissed the assembly. It just, we've got a fanatic in Pharisee Saul. And to close, from Pharisee Saul to Apostle Paul, change is necessary and possible in all of us. Don't let anybody tell you that they can't change from whatever behaviors, because if Paul can, Saul can change, so can anyone. And you might wonder why the name 
Saul became Paul. It was Paul himself that changed his name. Paul is the Greek form of the Hebrew name Saul. And in Acts 13 and 9, Saul, when he began to minister outside Jerusalem to Greek-speaking Jews and Gentiles, he decided to go by his Greek form of his name. And in Romans 8, Paul writes, verse 28 to 30, we know that all things, that's everything in our life, is working together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. All things are working to conform us to the image of Jesus, his character, his lifestyle, his walk, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, moreover whom he did predestine, predestine, predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, then he will also glorify in the kingdom, and that's how the world is going to be full of the glory and knowledge of God, Numbers 14, 21. And I really like this verse from Titus 3, and I've left out verse 6, but it's 4, 5, and 7, and it's from the New Living Translation, and I'll close with that. When God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, us and Saul the Pharisee, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. Because of his grace, he made us right in his sight, and he gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sister Sandra. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments or anything to add? Oh, Maggie, I muted you. Um, so you'll have to, Maggie, you'll have to unmute. You can keep talking okay. while you're doing it. Okay, can you hear okay. me now? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know how we can add to that. So, so complete. And thank you, Sandra. Um, there's just one little thing that I've always thought, you know, when, when Jesus stopped um, Paul on the way, on the road to Damascus, and he said, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. And people always say, that's like the pricks are, um, of, the, of a tool that is used to make the the oxen that are pulling the plow, make them move forward. They, they use this goad. And I, while it may be that, I think it has a greater meaning because Paul, he's, or he was Saul at the time, he had stood there and he'd heard Stephen's confession and he knew even though he ne he wouldn't admit it at the time he knew that it was the truth and it was the truth of God's word and so to hear that and still stand there and watch him being being uh, stoned to death it must have pricked his conscience so I think to kick against the pricks the, the greater meaning of that is the pricks of your conscience you know and you won't let yourself think of it. That's why he was sort of so determined. Even when in the heat of the day, he's got to go to Damascus. He's not allowing himself to think. And Jesus stopped him and said, your conscience is pricking you. You've got to stop kicking against it. Right. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that was a year or so before Paul was converted. Apparently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. thank you Sandra oh, you're welcome and uh, a follow up next year might be how S Stephen actually influenced uh, Paul because I probably could give a talk just as long on that it's quite interesting when you really look into Paul's writings that Stephen, oh, he quoted him. Stephen was always on his mind you know, Steve, he was he quoted Stephen. It's mentioned a couple of times in Acts. I'm sure there are far more times. It's just not mentioned all the time. But he definitely quoted. So as you say, he was always on his mind. Yeah. 
Yeah. It was not a couple of years before he was baptized um, from when Jesus stopped him on the road to Damascus. He was baptized just at that time. Well, with what um, you just said there, Maggie, it uh, made me think of Peter because Paul, um, well, I mean, um, Peter still had to be converted even after all that he saw, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, after having um, denied Christ. But then um, now he sees him uh, coming to the, um, you know, to the shore and he's with Christ. And Christ is asking him the three questions, you know, um, maybe in a similar vein, you know, do you love me? And uh, like uh, he's saying to Paul, you know, why are you kicking against the goats, you know, and they're kicking against your conscience. And I guess in a way, Peter's having to wrestle with his conscience too and facing ourselves and our doubts and our uh the sins and our uh i guess i would call it process of our continual process of conversion and, and maturing in the truth we're, we're going through similar things so it's almost like an echo those two echo each other yeah yeah and it's, it's very it's, it's a process for sure yeah but but you know paul you know paul wasn't alone in that um peter as well peter in doing what he did consented and uh as did all anybody who abandoned christ at the time to his death um so but, we, well we even, even when paul confronts peter in galatians there yeah he, he's needing a conversion and still yeah because uh he was he was being a hypocrite um not he was wanting, he was siding with the Judaizers, wasn't he? You're right, and not uh, deciding that oh no, maybe I won't eat with these Gentiles uh, because that would be um, not legal. But he'd been told three times by the sheet that came down that it, nothing was unclean. So Paul uh, calls him on it. Mm -hmm. I think <laughs> that all our lives there are things that come up like that. I was baptized at 16, and I remember talking to somebody at one time and saying, I wish I could be baptized again, because I've been, gone through, so, <laughs> you know, I went through a few, two or three years of rebellion. My father had died when I was 17, but, uh, you know, I wish I could be baptized and start again, but that's not the way it goes. You mm -hmm. do, you, you and, and all through your life, you have to, you have to be converted. You keep on working at it. Yeah. Yeah. Always have to remember that it's a it's a beginning. Yeah. Well, and every Bible class, don't we all just learn something? Like it, we never stop learning. Never mind being converted. I mean, I'm just always something popping off the page that just astounds me like where did that come from i've got the same bible i started with uh this one in 75 yeah. 1975 and i have had it rebound because i didn't want to lose my notes and uh, man i'm like i know what's on the upper upper right corner the bottom left corner and so on but all of a sudden in a bible class i'm like okay where did that come from yeah well, Paul, Paul too, you know, he says, you know, I, I, uh, that which I would, I do, I, you know, that which I would do, I do not, and that which I would not do, that I do. So yeah. all these things are written for us, like all these mighty men and women were fallible. They were sinners. Right. We're all sinners. On so the end. Yeah. So. Yeah. And lately, there's this fad. I gotta, you gotta put this out here. <laughs> of uh, there's a quite a few women, like their daughters, that were brought up in in the truth. They're they're going in for this wokeism, and even to the point where they're saying, "Oh, my identity is is a, is a boy or a man or whatever." And and they'll, you know, um, uh, in, in the distress that some of the parents feel, they just have to remember. 
It's a process. Always, always pray. And even if when you are dead, that, you know, the fruit might happen. And um, when I ran a, a, a Christadelphia prayer group on the Facebook, an interesting thing, and Maggie helped out with this somewhat now, um, in that uh, this one girl, uh, she said, I don't think God can forgive me, she said, but my, my, I've been rebelling for so long. And when I went and saw my mother, as she was dying, she held my hand and she said, um, I'll see you in the kingdom. And she said at that moment, her heart changed and, uh, and her mother died without her knowing that she had come back to the meeting, but we had to encourage her. And I remember, I remember you, Maggie saying to her, you, you, yeah, you know, you're going to be welcome to, to you know, people are, she was afraid people were going to want to see her. I stuff. don't remember that. Oh, well, Ruth, her name was Ruth. Maybe that'll trigger something. But anyway, yeah. uh, and Kelly, Kelly was working with me on it and that, uh, that kind of thing. And Kelly, Kelly Jackson um, used to be Miles. And anyway, um, so there's, there's all these, these heartaches that people can go through. Always remember Paul, remember Peter, remember, you know, remember all that. There's lots of examples in the, in, in the, in the Ecclesias where people uh, brought up as children rebelled and, and not even until the, like they're in their forties, fifties and sixties, then they return. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice seeing you, Kathy. Oh, I I'm, I'm so glad I could make it. I thought that was excellent. Yes. It's just good to see you, Kathy. Hey, Andrew. Um, okay, let's go ahead. I will close with prayer, um, and then we can wrap up. And dear Father, thank you so much for this time to spend together with sisters and others who love your word and love learning of you and serving you. We thank you for the words of Sister Sandra, and we can learn a lot from the life of the Apostle Paul and the amazing transformation he went through, which is something we all have to go through many times throughout our lives. We ask that you be with us, that you be with those who are suffering, be with those who are mourning, be with all those who are searching for you. We pray for you, the return of your son to be very soon, and we look forward to that day. We ask these things through Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jessica, for this yeah, whole program it's good yeah and next next week you say is uh the study weekend and it'll be on zoom yeah. too right yes yeah. saturday morning we'll have the classes on zoom starting around uh, around nine um okay. it always well, kind, of, kind of a rolling start so we'll see okay only Let's... if we get lunch as well okay i'll have that i'll have oh, that <laughs> it was so good that that mm -hmm. last one in november yeah i was glad you could make that Nice to be able to go things. Um, yeah, Sandra, um, I hope to be up in North Bay at some point in the near future. Are you still? Are, I, don't, are you? I don't get home until the end of April. I'm in Florida right now. Oh, okay. Maybe I might drop in on Maggie. I think we're going to talk. Yeah, to you're her. welcome to drop in on us for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah well, if you come up this summer, make sure you drop by because I'll be there all we, summer for sure. We, we uh, do. Our Acacia's getting back together. In April, that's I think a seventh, but that first Sunday in April anyway, we'll be back together, God willing. Oh, that's good to know. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. It's uh, March. I have a, my grandson who is um, up in North Bay. I uh, have some okay. grandchildren. So what what I've been hoping is somehow being able to get them to come on out <laughs> and um, and uh, and and meet with people um, and. Uh, who we'll knows? make sure you contact me before and then we can make arrangements, okay? Right, right. Okay. All right. Well, see you all great. at some point or other. Have, yeah. have a grateful day, everyone. One o'clock is a study from uh, Toronto East. Yeah. Bye. 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 Yeah.